two. One. What the hell, the sidebar just went away where I can play the sound files. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Did on yeah. mine too. Must be a new feature. <laughs> <laughs> Stop changing things. Okay, where's it? It's another Friday. This week I did it my way. I made lots of juice, and now I feel a boost. Baby, say, oh, it's the way I make my juice. Grass and fruits and roots. This week I did it my way. Baby, say, oh, now let's have some fun. There is nothing greater than Friday's act of nature. Ow, ow, ow! What's up, my juice lovers? Welcome to... Good Nature Radio. This is your host, Charlie Wetlawfer, joined by my esteemed co host, juice business consultant Ari Sexner, and the founder of Southern Press Juicery Wild Crafted Collection, Olivia Esquivel. And also today, we're joined by friend of the pod, brother of mine, CEO of Good Nature, Eric Wetlawfer. What's up, guys? Hi, everyone. Um, we took last week off. Basically, we uh, had a big company-wide meeting in Buffalo for all the Good Nature staff that we had to attend to. It was really great. Eric gave an amazing speech and got everybody fired up about the future of the company. It was awesome. Um, And I do think going forward, we're going to change the format to every other week for a while, just because everybody's super busy right now. And... um, um, I feel like every two weeks will give us plenty of new material every episode to discuss, and it'll just be sort of a better format. Might switch back to every week. Uh, we'll see. So I wanted to start off today. By the way, we have a great episode. We got a, a very interesting voicemail about HACCP plans that I think Ari will really like to dig into. Um, we have right. somebody asking about declining sales in the economy right now and juice bars. Uh, we're going to talk about overflowing presses when you're making nut milk and other things. And uh, But I wanted to start out. So as we discussed on the last episode, Good Nature launched a brand new website, which I hope everybody's had a chance to check out. It's really nice. And part of the new website is sort of a refreshed branding and our new mission statement, um, which we feel is more in line with the true values of good nature where the last one. So our previous mission statement for the last five years or so was to elevate the juicing experience. And although that sounds pretty cool, it's kind of like, well, what does that even mean? Like we, we are elevating the juicing experience in a lot of ways, but um, we wanted to really get to the root of good nature being a family business and how passionate we are as owners and our awesome customers and the whole juicing community. So our new mission statement, let me pull it up just so I don't say it incorrectly here. Our mission is to help people and their families live healthier and happier lives. And the ways we're accomplishing that are by inventing juicing technologies that produce the healthiest the most delicious juice possible, providing expert consulting services that enable our clients to serve better juice to more people. Olivia and Ari, thanks to you guys. And doing our part to build a supportive, helpful community for our industry. Um, Because we're a family business, and what we value most about our business is sort of how we help other families like ours live better lives. (coughs) And Eric... I was hoping you could talk a bit about sort of what you talked about in the meeting. Um, it was about sort of the history of good nature and what the future of the company and, and everything sort of means to you, basically. Sure. Happy to. Um, so, you know, our, the wet lawfers, our family has been doing this for like, like almost 50 years now, building juicers and stuff. Um, And it started in our dad's barn. It was a pretty crazy thing to do. But he wanted to just 
make good stuff and have customers who are happy to buy things from him and support this little family company. You know, he always says that his dream was to just be busy enough where he could support his family and spend a lot of time with them. And through my experience working here, um, I was been reflecting on it the past few weeks a lot. And I've realized and I was looking through pictures of like my kids juicing with us and I kind of realized that, wow, I am a consumer of this good nature stuff and I've become healthier and my family is happier just because of my exposure to the juicing world. I mean, we're just a regular family and we have lots of healthy and unhealthy habits, but I'm really proud to say that the work that we do at Good Nature has, for me, as a participant in juicing, I bring home juice a lot. I include my kids in it. And it's just this family activity um, that really does make us healthier and lets us bond and makes us happier. And I think it's, it's much more than just inventing a piece of equipment. Um, it's really all the things that we do as a company and the people that work with us and the support that we give because our customers are really, you know, helping all, each one of our customers has their own group of customers and those people are juicing for the families and buying healthy food and on some path to better health. And it, you know, when we hear those stories, we go, oh, that's why we do this. Um, and it's different than, you know, elevating the juicing experience. It's no, we want people to be healthy. And when you're healthy, you're happy. So we kind of distilled it down into a easier to explain and easier to understand mission statement, which helps guide decisions we make in the workday. Um, you know, if, if offering this piece of equipment is going to get us closer to these goals, then we're happy to. And the future of the company is, it's really exciting. Um, I'm personally very fire, fired up about this year and the next few years, just things that we're working on. And to be able to further entrench in this uh, world that we're in and deliver new products and, you know, all these sets of families. For every person that gets into juicing, it's kind of, they get more people into juicing and more people into juicing. And I'm just excited to see how far we can take this mission that we're on. Having a good mission statement at a business like if we talk about what it means to a company really, as you said, helps guide your decisions, right? Like if someone comes to you like, hey, why don't we make this cool machine that like, I don't know, does something like makes fancy foam to put on top of juice or something. Sure. And you think, well, does that help us achieve what we're trying to make people healthy? Well, no, but it, it's kind of cool. It's like, well, let's not do that then because that's not really um, aligned with our mission. I mean, that might have been a weird example, but... <laughs> no, it's true. It's like, well, how important is this for our mission? Yeah, we might sell a bunch of it or it might drive some, you know, maybe some trendy thing that we can participate in. But I think what people... Our branding is... I don't know. Some people think we're like this big company. Um, we're really a family business. you know. My wife and my daughter were here for lunch today. Everyone knew that. It's like, it's <clears throat> we're small. And I'm proud of the work that we do here. Everyone works very hard. And it's just so great to work somewhere where people are trying to do good stuff. And, you know, we're sticking our necks out a bit. We're taking on risk to deliver these products. Um, and it's it's a fun way to spend the days. And you think back to our dad. Uh, in the barn trying to get his first sets of customers and it seems crazy you know he's like broke but he started this path which is no we're just going to go for it and we'll see how see how much we can do and see how far we can go and it's really you know 50 years later here we are it's pretty exciting well, back then they were trying to find five or ten customers you know and yeah. now we're trying to find you know 500 customers or a thousand customers it's um it's probably about similar feeling where it's kind of scary and feels kind of risky and there's a lot of ups and downs. Like the economy has really taken a hit to our business in the last uh, four or five months, but it's rewarding in the end. 
I think it's really important how you guys um, dialed in that mission statement. It's something that I talk to, you know, juice bars that I'm consulting with a lot. Like, you know, you could be a lot of different things, right? Like you could do carbonated juice. You could do, you know, a, a bunch, you could do smoothies and juice, right? Like you could be like a Vitamix or a Breville that now does a million different things or a Ninja. Um, and just from a little bit of an outside perspective looking in, because I'm not a good nature employee, that to me feels more in line with what you guys do as a, as a consumer of yours that buys your products for my own juice bar. Like when I mm -hmm. came in and toured um, the good nature facility just back in November, um, you know, Eric and Charlie took me around and they were like, oh, this is, and I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, but they were like, oh, this is so-and-so. He started the business with my dad. And then like, oh, you know, and it's like, some of them were like, yeah, we remember Charlie and Eric from when they were little and they were like, you know, hiding under the cabinets <laughs> and like, you know, throwing nuts at each other, like, you know, nuts and bolts and like messing up all the inventory. Like, I just think it's, it's so much more in line with who you guys are as a family. And I think it's so reflective as who we are as an industry that really like, I think you guys helped create this industry. I mean, to me, I think you helped create this sense of community. Like there's really not another manufacturer out there, at least for the equipment that I buy for my operations that is working not just on new inventions and, you know, improving the product at the, at the end of the day, but really working on improving the industry moving forward. Like, should we be in DC, you know, lobbying for things? Should we be getting together for meetups? You know, can we connect you with a chef or with a business consultant? Like, you know, Vitamix doesn't do that. Breville, Ninja, they don't do that. You know, I mean, it's, and I think that goes back to the fact that you are a small family, family run business. And every single juice bar I talk to is a family run business. It's built out of compassion and love for the product and love for, you know, trying to do your part to make your community healthier. So I think it really aligns not just with who you guys are, but with who your consumers are and what their goal is. We are happy to be part of this industry. And really, that I, I was just thinking we were talking, Olivia, Yeah, that the industry, yeah, we've done our part to help create it, but it has really created us. Yeah. And, you know, our role in it is to try to see where it's going and do new stuff. I love that, yeah. But we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the, all the family businesses supporting us. Yeah. Can, can you guys see this slide here? Yeah, it's so cool. I don't know if you guys even <laughs> realize it because they're your kids and you're so in it, you know, as like young dads, but it's like you're your dad, but like 2.0, you know, it's just so cool. Yeah. So that's our that's dad really cool. and that's me, me standing on the table there. That's little Eric down in the red, <laughs> in the red hat. Aww. And that's a, that's an old machine. My dad called the juice it, which was like his shot at the X1 mini. I love it. Uh, 30 years ago. <laughs> And it didn't quite take off. It had a lot of issues. Um, like the X1 Mini, we really refined it a lot. But it's just crazy seeing this. Um, I mean, there's uh, then there's our dad standing with Eric's and my sister's sons there. And it's just really cool. Okay, but you guys should do one of those reenactment things. You know, where like you get in the same position now as adults. Have you seen those hilarious pictures like yeah, on yeah. Instagram where they show like the baby picture, but then you have like Eric in a red hat, like kneel, kneel down by the juicer right. and like Charlie on the table and you <laughs> recreate the whole image as like adults. Oh, those are my favorite. Yeah, we should do that. Yeah, that's hilarious. Anyway, yeah, it's just, it's been fun. Um, I'm really excited for the future of the company. I think, uh, and Olivia, that, that reminded me. So you're working on putting together a meetup, right? In down in yeah. North Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. In Greenville. Mm hmm. Yeah. And we're kind of still playing with what, what we'll be doing there, what we'll be offering, um, you know, whether there'll be some just meet and greet community time. I think there's, you know, there's a lot of juice bars on the East coast that, can get to us pretty easily. Chef Ari is close to me. You know, he's in Charlotte where one of my locations is. So it's just easy for the two of us to get together. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd like to maybe do some hands-on experience there. You know, we can meet up at, at my shop, one of my shops and use the X1. So I think it'll be an opportunity to, to really, you know, things that we haven't been able to do before in JuiceCon, right? Like you see the equipment, but you don't see the chef throwing, you know, produce and 
talking about yield and stuff like that. And so I'm excited. We haven't nailed down any details yet, but I'm thinking um, early spring is what we're shooting for. Yeah, probably early spring. We don't really know what it's going to be yet. Maybe like a mini juice con or something, but yeah. a lot more hands-on stuff actually in a juice bar, which will be fun. So more details to come in that later. Olivia's yeah. kind of Olivia's kind of putting the whole thing together. So I mean, together. Um, also, are you in your house now? Actually, I am. You guys, <laughs> you've seen me through the lows and the highs from when I was homeless <laughs> to like, you know, here in my office. Yeah, I still have to decorate yeah. it. I think I'm going to get this really cool idea of getting like a, a sign in the back that says, no juice, no future. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> it's got, I've got the perfect spot yeah, for it right yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. It's always a I'm going to hang my beyond. chef's coats on the side. <laughs> no, you, you'll be like, no, this is different. This says no future, no juice. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to do mo um, juice, mo problems. Oh, that's pretty good too. Yeah. Forget there's who Hugo Fresh used to do some play on words Matt like Sherman, that, yeah. Yeah. Like some in their Winwood operation in Miami. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And Ari, you've you've been busy lately. You've been traveling a lot. Yeah. I have a lot. So it's been doing a lot of in person consulting, kinda wide range of stuff from people opening to people that have been operational for years and kind of want a little refresh and make sure they're as efficient as possible. I mean, that, that consulting to me is the most rewarding for sure. Mm. Just being able to get out there and, and get more hands on, uh, is really rewarding for me and, and the clients as well. I, I hope so. Uh, yeah, it's all, it's a great opportunity to just go out, uh, and just, come up with new recipes, you know, train the staff with sanitation, uh, a lot of different aspects we can cover during that as well. I, I feel like you've been to like 10 different places in the last couple of months. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of missed the, the, the radio show last week, but I, I'm glad the travel's been pretty good so far, but went over the West coast, East coast, all over. So, and awesome. it's still going this whole month. So. Mm -hmm. nice yeah Ari's officially like a real consultant just every time I talk to him he's in a different city <laughs> meeting yeah. with a different client that's awesome all right so we have a good voicemail this week so first I actually I found this question on Facebook that I thought would be good about HACCP plans and then we also got a voicemail about HACCP plans then I realized the same person that asked the question on <laughs> Facebook unless of this the HACCP happy oh. <laughs> so I figure we'll just play the voicemail. Let me go ahead and play that. Hi, Good Nature. This is Kristen from Ventura, California. Oh, no, it's not the same person. I'm sorry. Someone named Tara left the Facebook message. Mm. And Kristen, I guess mm. I was looking at two things at once and I got confused. So, okay, let me, we'll, we'll do the voicemail first and we'll do the Facebook question. Hi, Good Nature. This is Kristen from Ventura, California. I have a question for, I believe Chef Ari might be the best to answer this. Um, we are looking at getting a processed food registration for the state of California, and they are trying to see if our company falls under needing a juice HACCP plan. We don't do cold pressed juices. We just do bottled blended smoothies. And I'm waiting to hear back from them to see what they say about requiring a juice has a plan and i was wondering if maybe you could kind of give your point of view um i'd hate for them to come back and say that i do need a juice has a plan and have to go through all of that work and not actually need one and so i'm it costs more money to do it that way so i'm wondering if you could kind of give me a point of view from your perspective what you think if i would need one or not basically what we do as a company is take frozen fruit blend it with almond milk, protein powders, chia seeds, things like that, bottle it and freeze it and then deliver it to the customer frozen. So if you could give me any tips or pointers on whether you think I need that or not, and if I don't, maybe I could give them those pointers back and not have to go through the juice HACCP hassle. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. I, like, so I'll, I'll get into HACCP 
and kind of explain it, but you guys stop me if I get too in depth on it. Ari, you should, uh, your sign should say no HACCP, no future. <laughs> yeah. <I'm> just... <laughs> That'd be good. That's so good. Yeah. Charlie, I should make send us all Ari that. You... <laughs> yeah. yeah, we, we should. We should signs. all come up with our own. Our own, our own science. Yeah. I already need something in the background anyway. So does Olivia. So we'll send yeah. you guys some yeah. science. Oh, I'm getting I, stuff. I, it's, I'm I think this is I, the first voicemail that is uh, addressed to me too. So <laughs> I'm a little excited <laughs> about that as well. I, I also like notebook. that you called it the HACCP hassle. I feel like that's a good sort of way oh, to yeah. describe. I missed that. Very that's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead, Ari. Yes, yeah, so, so HACCP, it... It basically is for any kind of special process you do in the kitchen, you know, and there's all these different special processes, whether you're putting product, you're monitoring pH level in a bag, or you're doing like a cook chill or sous vide or anything like that. In regards to juice, it's under one special process, and that's reduced oxygen packaging or ROP. Okay. And you're... The HACCP, it's, it's basically developed for large manufacturers, you know, where they do the five log reduction, they send it through a pasteurizer, HPP, HTST, some other equipment, and then they, they scientifically test it to make sure it hit that five log reduction or reduce the amount of pathogens. The challenge is the local inspection agencies interpret these rules uh, down to a, a raw HACCP level, you know, so it's it's basically taking that HACCP plan and interpreting to their local level. So the HACCP typically only comes in effect when you're bottling a juice, you're capping it, and you're doing any form of transportation. That's how the regulation should be. It's not always interpreted that way, but that is how it should be. And what transportation means is Say you're getting inspected, you get a letter grade or number grade for that kitchen. As long as you're selling it in that area, then you don't need one. If you're moving outside that area, say you're in a hotel, you're producing it in a kitchen and you're selling it up front and it's different letter grades for those areas, that's considered transportation. Uh, anytime it's leaving a facility, that's when the HACCP is typically required, you know, and I know you said it's a hassle. It, it is a hassle, you know, but it is something great to have once you have it implemented uh, for two main reasons. You have traceability piece. Some issue comes up, you could track everything, you know, where say there's an issue with a product, someone says they got sick from it. Uh, you have a list of documentations on how you handled that juice properly, you know, how you transport it, how you stored it, how you prepared it. You know, and that's a great thing that you might not always have. The second thing is uh, you have amazing consistency. You know, you're making sure you're slowing down from doing the same routine over and over, and you're actually making sure you're hitting all the proper levels in terms of uh, products you're using to clean in the, the produce or the temperatures of the juice is uh, being chilled rapidly. So it is a hassle initially, but you're setting yourself up for the future for sure. He's not going to like that answer. <laughs> um, well, also, I future plan. self will. <laughs> but she just needs to call you and then she won't have to worry about it. Yeah. We could help her out with everything. So. Yeah. I also looked up the definition of juice because she's asking like, okay, this stuff is technically puree and not uh, right. juice. So this is from the FDA.gov website. What types of juice and juice products are covered by the regulation? Regulation applies to products sold as such or used as an ingredient in beverages. Juice means the aqueous liquid expressed or extracted from one or more fruits or vegetables. Purees of the edible portions of one or more fruits or vegetables. So that would be a smoothie. Or any concentrates mm. of such liquid or puree. Juice produced by a person who operates yeah, a retail establishment. Are not covered by the regulation. So, yeah, if you're selling direct to customers through a retail establishment, you don't need it. But you know, if you're shipping the stuff and you're and they tell you you need it, you're probably just going to have to do it. Yeah, she's doing the proper process, though. I mean, yeah. 
talk to your local inspection agency, you know, get clarification, see how they interpret it. That's the way it should be interpreted. But, uh, you know, you, you hear some crazy things. It, your local inspection agency, the more educated they are, the easier it is, actually. So, All right, all right, rapid fire. I've got another one for you here. So this is from someone named Tara in our Facebook group. Looking for a clarification from Pennsylvania juice bar owners. If I juice in my juice bar, bottle it, not HPP, and sell it direct to my customers, do I need a HACCP plan? I always thought I did. However, I found this statement on the FDA website. Retail establishments or businesses that make and sell juice directly to consumers do not sell or distribute juice to other business businesses are exempt from the juice HACCP regulation, but must comply with the FDA's food labeling regulation that requires a warning statement on packaged fruit and vegetable juice products that have not been processed to prevent, reduce, or eliminate pathogenic microorganisms that may be present with any applicable state regulations. And then she continues, My bottles do have a warning label on them. Second part to this question, I'm opening a second location. If I juice at one location and transport it to another location, not selling wholesale, it's the same business under one LLC, will that require a HACCP plan? So first question, do you need it selling direct to customers? Second question, two locations. If, if it's not being transported, you don't need one. I have seen some really odd cases where they split up the kitchen, the back of the house with the front of the house, where they get inspected and say you, you know, you get the letter grade or number grade, and they have they split it up actually where they have the front of the house gets one and the back of the house gets one. They can technically move that as transportation, even though it's moving over a counter into your display case in the front of the the operation. You know, if they want to get technical with that, you know. But uh, typically, it is not. You you won't be required to have a HACCP uh, as long as it's still in that same facility. Uh, but if you're producing in one location and you're moving it to your second location, you you're definitely will. But here's the question, Ari. Like, mm -hmm. I don't recall Department of Health ever asking to see my HACCP plan except for when I mm -hmm. opened. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not part okay. of your normal inspection, right? I'm not saying it's, don't do it. I'm just saying it's not part yeah. of my normal. It hasn't been part of my normal inspections. No, I, that's a good point, too, because a lot of, say, you're the Department of Agriculture or the local health department, a lot of times they're either overfunded or underfunded. Right. You know, and if they're getting the proper funding, they'll usually have a special process team, you know, that just deals with HACCP plans. Whereas if, if that's the case, you'll, you'll be uh, inspected twice, essentially, you know, just for your kitchen and then for the HACCP plan, you know, and you could actually, they call it a living document. So you can make revisions, submit it, and they'll adjust it or add different processes in. Uh, so you could do that, but it's, it's a different case everywhere. I did, uh, my, the first HACCP I had to do was, both for the local health department and then certified organic with the Department of Agriculture. And halfway through that process, the Department of Agriculture actually cut funding for that whole process. And then we needed outsource uh kind of like an auditor for that process. You know, so it that's kind of where it changes and why you get so many different oh, this is allowed in my area, this isn't allowed in my area, or we could do that, no issue. It's not the same across the board. You know, it, it just, you get them on board, you get everything in writing, you know, you you could send them an email, you could have them sign off on the documents, you know, stating it whether you need it or not. Uh, that way, if they change their mind later, you can present that document and they'll give you some time to be able to make the adjustments. Interesting. So I guess if something went wrong and say your juice ended up having E. coli in it and got people sick, and then they did an inspection, mm -hmm. found out you weren't following your HACCP plan, then you could get in a lot of trouble, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, it, it seems like they're out to get you a lot of times, but basically they want to put out a safe product. You know, mm -hmm. it's, that's, that's a bottom line, really. 
Yeah, I mean, I definitely think it's important to have. And um, I remember it being part of my process when I opened my first one. But when we got um, inspected for our second Greenville location, they didn't ask me for it. And when I've been there for DHEC inspections, so it's not something that, that, at least in my case in South Carolina and North Carolina, something that they ask to see every single time. It's something that we do have. Um, the things that they ask me for every single time is the, the vomit, diarrhea, you know, protocol pickup. And does everybody know where that is? Um, the proper cleanup for that it has to be like posted somewhere visible. And then the food handlers certification, there has to be a manager present um, at all times with that certification. What'd you call it? Yeah. Vomit, yeah. diarrhea, protocol think, pickup? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. That's it, but it's something <laughs> it's, like that, right, Shep? <laughs> Yeah, that, it's like that's a really, a really big name. one, especially since the past What's that about? five Huge. years. <laughs> it, it's a, essentially like oh, it's, it's all like, employees know if they have any of these yeah. conditions, mm. they do not show up to work. You no, know? but it also, there's a second po component of it. If there is an episode in your restaurant or in your bathroom about how the proper way to clean up, um, and it has to be posted, like the proper way to clean that situation um, so that you can remain open and it has like very strict rules and it has to be posted. And yeah, you have to have that. They'll give it to you. Like, it's not something you have to make up. It's something that you, that the department of health will give to you, at least in my scenario, but you have to have it posted. And, um, there's also a component of it that everybody has to sign. I think that might be the, the one about, you know, if you're feeling in any of these things, so you have to, sometimes they'll ask you to show that all employees have, have signed whatever the code of, diarrhea code <laughs> employee illness policy i think and, and oh is that what it is <laughs> they'll, they'll do that all the time they'll they'll show up yeah. and say what's your employee illness policy to an employee and yeah they you gotta have the employee go over there and they can read from it if they want but yeah they oh they've done that to me before so, yeah where yeah. they ask an associate like what is the company's policy and i've been like oh wait, wait, wait. i'm happy to hand it to you and she's like no no, no. Huh. i want them to tell me and i'm like oh my yeah. god you know like pointing at the door. I'm like, it's on the door. Yeah. But yeah, those are little things that, you know, that just seems so scary. But, um, you know, again, like I think we've said this before, Department of Health, it just seems so scary. But they really do give you an opportunity to like learn as you go and tell you, hey, we'll be back in the next week or two weeks. These are the things you're missing. Here's where you can get it. Um, just make sure it's corrected next time. Yeah. I mean, think about your operation. Like, yeah. If you put out a product and it happens to get someone sick, how are you going to be able to do like rectify that? How are you going to prove that you didn't put it in there? You know, a lot of times they can't, you know, but you can with HASA plans or certain logs and preventative measures in place. All right, let's move on. Uh, someone named Brittany in our Facebook group left a. Question here. Anyone else seeing a decline in sales? I thought that things would pick up after the holidays as it has in the past. Unfortunately, we're on a steady decline. Any advice? We offer juices, smoothies, and also have a small wellness shop, other health related products. Um, I will say, just before we go to Olivia on this one, um, I was checking. So we sell bottles on our website. The bottle sales year over year are down 25% which is a really good indicator that there's 25% less juices being sold compared to last December. I was looking at December. So it's obviously not a good sign, but I think with the state of the economy, it's not that surprising. Um, juice is pretty expensive and people are cutting back on, you know, discretionary spending right now. So I think during the pandemic, people... We're more concerned about immunity and have some extra cash to spend, so they were more willing to buy that ten dollar bottle of juice. Seems like not so much now, but things are still higher than they were before the pandemic. So it's not like things are worse than they were before the pandemic. Um, but anyway, Olivia, maybe do you have any advice of things yeah. Brittany might be able to consider no, looking at? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And and this happened to me the other day where I was looking at my sales versus last year's, you know, sales when we were still pretty much in COVID. 
And I, I had to keep telling myself, like, stop comparing, stop comparing, stop comparing, because it's just whoosh, straight down. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when I compare it to three years before that, like before COVID, I'm still, you know, increasing there. So it's just it's really hard to, you know, when an industry, I think, spikes like that, it's really hard to come off of that and feel good. But you just have to remember, like, that was a very, you know, unusual circumstance. So try not to compare yourself to COVID sales because most of us saw a dramatic increase in sales because of immunity. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is I always have a drop in sales in February, March. They're my two single, the end of January, February, beginning of March, my worst months of the year, always. Um, So I'm not sure what Brittany was doing before, But I, I always plan for this to be really hard time. And so that's why I push so hard for holiday sales to kind of get us some major cash flow to get through the end of this kind of weird period until the sun comes back out again and people start wanting smoothies. So, you know, I always like tell my staff, like, I don't know if there's anything I can do to increase 100 people, you know, get 100 more people a day into my shop. But what I can do is increase the ticket sales while they're there and decrease my labor. Those are the only two things that I feel like I can really affect. Um, like a hundred percent for sure. So looking to see what I can do to increase ticket prices, you know, having, uh, maybe if you have a protein smoothie, can you retail a protein, um, and get a $45, $50, you know, ticket on that, um, you know, carrying supplements. There's some clients I'm talking to about that, like really starting to lean into that wellness section, kind of staying still on brand, but just picking up some other little things that, um, kind of just help you get over the slump. And then I don't know if Jeff agrees with me on this, but I'm of the mindset that if you're already doing smoothies, you already have the equipment for that and you already have the fruit. I think it's a natural um, evolution to go into acai bowls. Um, You have all the same thing. So it's basically just increasing um, another menu item. Um, I don't really usually, my smoothie people are not the same as my acai bowl people. So it's not like I'm just switching them to another side of the menu. They're two different people. Um, so for me, that seems just listening to her menu offerings. That seems like the next obvious thing for her, particularly as she starts to go into spring is start to really master some acai bowls. You've already got all the right stuff there, cut back on labor and just try to increase, you know, can you add almond butter, peanut butter or whatever you use in your shop? Can you, can you have your associates ask every single person, do you want to add almond butter to that? It's our favorite way. We definitely recommend it. Can you get those extra 100, 200, $300? extras a day without having to increase labor, um, you know, or try to find another hundred people through the door. I remember you saying on a previous episode, somebody was asking about December sales being low. And I remember you saying like, you think December's bad, get ready for January, February. I remember you sort of warning that January, February. (laughs) It's rough. Yeah. I mean, it's just kind of like, a ugh, like who wants something cold? It's cold and rainy out. You know, um, the, you're really only key thing right here is focusing on cleanses and immunity. You know, right. um, I know that last year I, I put out an immunity cleanse after the detox cleanse and, and that took off really well, you know, just focusing on, you know, flu is going around really bad right now. And, um, a lot of respiratory stuff is going around. So maybe just focusing Less on the detox right now, since we're kind of moving into February and more on immunity boosting things. So putting together a cleanse package like that with a special price. Today is National Green Juice Day. So looking at your calendar, you know, by the time this airs, it will be gone. But um, looking at your calendar to see what's coming up, you know, Valentine's, you should be running specials for that. Um, Yeah, you just got to. Sorry, like the downtime, like you mentioned, I think it's a perfect time to kind of clean up everything. Yeah. You know, implement a hassle plan, but yeah. not not really that. But I mean, just <laughs> yeah. you know, the downtime is really good to make sure as efficient as possible. Test out new stuff, create new recipes. Yep. Make sure your everything's costed out properly. Yeah. You know, just get ready for that that next push. Yeah. Cut unnecessary cost when you're slow. Because mm-hmm. you'll be yeah. busy again, and you'll be glad you did that stuff. Yeah, yeah. we we've been through this many times at Good Nature. We're of a mm-hmm. really good year, a really good six months or something, and kind of the company kind of bloats, right? All these sales coming in, you hire people, yeah, your expenses go up. Then when things go down again, it forces you to cut back, which when things get better again, then you're more profitable. So it's almost kind of this weird blessing in disguise. 
when things are bad because it forces you to make the hard decisions and cut where necessary. Where if things are good and sales are rolling in, you don't really do that. You just don't feel the pressure. So if things get bad temporarily and pick up again later, that's almost better than things just being awesome the whole time. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the time to cut labor where you can. And then like owner operators take on as many shifts as you can to try to cut labor. And, um, you know, a lot of people like their hours cut, believe it or not, particularly if you've got younger teenagers and they're not living and dying by the salary or by their hourly. Just be like, hey, I know exams are coming up, (laughs) you know, go study or whatever. Um, I would always prioritize who who needs the money in your team, um, but try to take on as many shifts as you can and cut labor where you can. I mean, if you've got a shared tip pool, that actually is really great for people that need the money because they'll if you're on and you're not getting tips, they'll get more tips. So you know, kind of just thinking through all that and being really mindful about who you're cutting and how it affects the whole team. It's also an opportunity to renegotiate with suppliers. Mm-hmm. Um, you say, hey, we're really slow. We're hurting. We just can't swing this, whatever per pound price, anything you can do. Yeah. And like do that with every line on your you know, profit and loss statement. And you'll, there's going to be breaks you can get. Mm-hmm. You're definitely not the only juice bar telling them that. So they know you're not BSing them. When things are right. slow, they're probably slow industry wide. Yeah. So if you're calling them, they've had the same call with 10 other people already. And they probably just yeah. have and some And they're worried they're going to lose your account. Yeah. Yeah. And lose that recurring revenue. They're also probably slow and they're, they'll are they make some concessions to keep the business flowing. Um, so it's... All right, Olivia. You had a question from a client, I think, about overflowing yeah. the press with nut milk. Yeah. So so I did an inter- um, a live yesterday from one of my smaller Greenville locations. Typically, I like to do like recipes and stuff um, because a lot of people like those and they ask questions about consistency. But yesterday, I, I'd gotten a lot of questions about um, layout for the front of the house, you know, which blenders I like better, Vitamix versus Blendtec or whatever. And in this particular shop, I don't, I don't have a good nature. I, um, I have, I don't have a juicer there at all. We transport from the downtown location to this low, you know, smaller location. But somebody asked about when they're making cashew milk, because I mentioned that we make our almond milk on our X1. She said when she makes cashew milk, she's having difficulty because it's overflowing on the press. Um, and I was like, Oh, okay. You're going to have to tune in to the good nature radio podcast. Cause I will mm-hmm. ask chef Ari for you live on the air. So, um, chef, what is the deal with that? What do you, how do you prevent that? Is she doing something wrong or is that she just needs to press slower? Yeah. So all plant-based milks are the same concept. Yeah. Uh, you, you soak a product for a certain amount of time. Then you blend it with a liquid and then either filter it somehow, you know? So with, with fat content in certain nuts or tree nuts, uh, you got to kind of be wary on how long you're processing it. So it's, it's more of a, could be a soaking issue, but it's more of probably processing it in the blender because cashews are so high in fat. If you soak them for, I usually soak them for like four hours. Uh, they become real soft and it's very easy to over process that, you know? So the, the fat encapsulates the liquid and becomes kind of like a, that's how you make vegan mayonnaise basically. Uh, so you have two options either with cashews, you know, if you soak them, you either blend it less. You want to make sure it's gritty in that mixture. Uh, you know, it kind of, uh, it, it's got the consistency of like sand rather than being extremely smooth. Uh, and then press it and then you'll be able to extract the liquid from there. Or you could take it a different route and emulsify the whole thing. You know, just because it's got such a high fat content, you could soak the cashews for four hours. Then you uh, drain it, put it in a blender barely cover it with a liquid and blend it and it'll emulsify and then slowly add the rest of the liquid. And then you could pass that through just like a a sieve or a a strainer, you know? So you got two options to be able to process that cashew milk, but it sounds like she's just processing a little too much or possibly soaking it for a little too long. Yeah. In my experience, just what I said, it's just probably clogging the bag because the pieces are too small of the cashews because cashews, break apart a lot easier than almonds. 
So if you're grinding the cashews the same amount as you're grinding almonds, it's going to be a lot finer. So I think just probably, I would guess just grinding less would be the answer there in the Vitamix. Mm -hmm. All right, pro tips. Yeah. Olivia, go now. <laughs> okay, so if you're going to run a special, um, like National Green Juice Day, I want you to really run something significant. Don't be thinking about this oh, wait, is where I'm going to make money. We forgot to talk money. about that. Be thinking of... <laughs> What do you mean? We about National about Green Juice Day? Day. Yeah. Oh, well, I guess you're talking about it now. This is the second so time it's... I mentioned it all today. It is? I oh. saw... Yeah, I, I just mentioned it. The, I saw the flags oh. outside, and I was like, not Veterans Day. It's not... <laughs> I was like, what's going on? And I was like, it's oh, not, it's, it's Green it's Juice Day. It's not the World Day, Cup. Yeah. <laughs> not the World Cup. Sorry, I must have been reading oh, something when you mentioned it earlier. Okay, so Green Juice Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, was, I was just saying it's Green Juice Day. So, so when you're looking at doing a special like, you know, Father's Day, February, Valentine's Day or something, don't think so much about, um, oh, this is an opportunity for me to make money. Think of it more as this is quantity over quality. So I just want a lot of people coming through the door. So, you know, on Father's Day, can you do like a, a giveaway of a small juice for all fathers that come in the shop. You know, it's rare that you're going to have a dad come in, get a free juice and walk out, right? He's going to come in with his family. They're going to order two or three things. He's going to be appreciative for the little nod to Father's Day. And now you've had a, a, a bigger increase in a ticket that you would have probably never had. So for Green Juice Day, I know you guys are going to hear this after, but don't do 10% off of a green juice. I mean, I don't get out of my chair for 10%. You know, it's it's a dollar off if it's a $10 juice. Like, Make it mm -hmm. significant, like buy two, get one free. Or, um, you know, I know that Caroline at Lotus Juicery, she's doing free mini green juices, which I thought was really great. Like, don't worry so much about, hey, this is a t chance for me to make a crap ton of money on Green Juice Day or Valentine's Day. It's just a, a nod to get people in while they're there. They'll buy other things and be thankful that you ran a cool special for them. So make it count. Good tip. Um and by the way, Green Juice Day was started by Evolution Fresh, one of their good nature customers back in 2016. Fun fact. I was just going to say, I looked at when, before I knew that there was a Green Juice Day, like maybe five or six years ago, um, we always looked to see what the national holidays are. And I was like, oh, we should have a national Green Juice Day. And we Googled it. And lo and behold, Evolution Juice had already done it. So mm -hmm. yeah. good nature. Well, people. they did all the hard work then. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, no, I, I was going to mention earlier, so about the declining sales, I saw mm. one of our local Austin juice brands, Daily Juice, is going out of business, um, which is unfortunate. I, I actually think out of the multi-location juice bars in Austin, they have the best juice, so it makes me sad. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's some like single location ones that I, I think are a little bit better, but um, but what's funny is... Oh, well, it's not funny, okay, but what's interesting is that I, I think earlier on when we started the podcast, I mentioned, we were talking about labor costs and stuff, and I mentioned I walked into a juice bar, and there were three people playing cards, like these three teenage girls at this table. I walked in, looked around, didn't see any employees, and then one of those girls got up, walked behind the counter, and took my order, and then made my smoothie, and then sat back down and started playing cards again, and that, that was a daily juice location just hard when you have multiple locations like that to have a manager or an owner operator that can be everywhere at one time. I mean, it's not that it can't be done. You just have to find the right team, you know, and um, then you just get really salary heavy. So it's hard. There's not that much margin in juice guys, but um, yeah, just controlling yeah. your labor is just one of the only things you can control. Yeah. It's, it's really tough. I agree. All right, Ari, you got a pro tip? Yeah, it's actually green juice themed as well. So, <laughs> uh, I think green juice is really the the most important category of any juice bar, for sure. It's got the biggest range. It's got the most benefits. It's it's everything for a juice bar, you know. So that's why it's so important. But also, it's the most. Uh, you need the most technique as well in the green juice. If you have poor technique, it will definitely show in the end product. So 
my pro tip is not about the major stuff that you could do for a high quality juice, like with the highest quality produce equipment or, you know, the proper acidity. It's kind of like the little known things that uh, can d- directly impact your green juice if if you don't pay attention to it. You know, and one of them is chilling your produce beforehand is extremely important. A lot of times people might keep uh, certain produce outside the refrigerator. So if you keep, if you weigh your product for that juice blend, you keep it refrigerated, uh, you'll have a much better quality product because it's it's quicker to chill down below that 41 degrees. Uh, you might not even need a, a cool down step. You might be able to juice it and still have it below that temperature. Keeping it in that uh, outside of that temperature change zone will definitely lead to a higher quality product. Uh, another aspect is making sure your equipment's up to par, you know, especially with like uh, the Good Nature X1 or something. A lot of times you won't know the blade is dull, you know, uh, until you put a new blade on or you don't monitor that consistently. That could definitely lead to uh, a less quality juice, you know. so. And another thing is how you how you press the product through the juicer. You know, you got to give it gentle taps. If you're kind of forcing the product in or throwing it in any kind of juicer with, with kind of force, that'll actually lead to more separation. You know, if you're using like any kind of juicer and you juice all the celery first and then all the kale, you don't kind of mix it, that could definitely lead to more separation. So... You want to be gentle with that process and be able to mix the products as, as much as you can. So that's my few pro tips. For we said day. one pro tip, Ari. That's overachiever. <laughs> well, we're going every other week now. We have to get them all in. <laughs> yeah. It's important. This uh, is why yeah, I think the, it would be so good to have like a hands-on experience with Ari in Greenville mm-hmm. of like him on the X1 and like, hey, this Look is- Look at Olivia pitching, you know, pitching her event already. I love it. <laughs> dream team, dream team. <laughs> the dream. Oh, that's what we should call it. Yeah. We should call it like the dream team summit or something. Yeah. Uh, Get t-shirts. Okay. So R&D. about Salesforce, the, the dream summit. Anyway. <laughs> the dream team. Yeah. Force or something. I think Salesforce's summit is dream force already. Yeah. Yeah. Dream. I think it is dream force. It's a crazy event. They take over the whole city. So <laughs> the putting the new X1 blade, I think, is such a good tip. That's such an overlooked thing because it gets dulls very slowly over time. So your operators don't notice it, but you'll walk into a juice bar and you see them like, rah, 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 like trying to shove this stuff down the, the grinder. Yeah. It's bruising the fruit, making it separate. And then you throw a new blade on there and stuff just goes through like, zzz, you know, you almost don't even have to push it. And their eyes just well, light often, up like, whoa. How often should you replace those? Like, what's the usage? If you're busy, probably every few months. Hmm. Yeah. Let's see. Right, well, it depends on how much you, thing. yeah, how much you juice kind of affects that too. But that's kind of <clears> the range where you want to be. Like, it's it surprisingly, it, not just a blade, how fragile green juice is after it's actually juiced. You know, if you... If it if it happens to go above the temperature danger zone for a little bit and come back down, or you know you freeze it and thaw it, it could it it directly affects it so much. Eric, pro tip, go. Pro tip is related to being slow as a business. Kind of uh, been on the topic today, so my pro tip is to lean on your employees to help identify places where you could save money. Um, you know, if you're looking for waste or things that you don't need to spend money on, everyone knows something you don't know in your company and you you can't dig through and find it all yourself. So I think it's good to be transparent with people like, Hey, cash is tight. They won't have any ideas how we can, you know, trim back costs. And someone might be like, Oh, we dump a lot of this juice out every Thursday. I'm like, oh, okay, we'll stop making that juice for us as a manufacturing company. There's a lot of like inventory stuff and services we pay for, but invariably most of the things we find are things employees find and bring to us that we didn't know about. There's a lot of uh, software subscription payments we're making that we could cut back on. We had one 
we had one like office Microsoft office bill that was coming in and like, we still couldn't find out who it was for, what it was for the email that was tied to it. Anything was just like hitting our corporate account. We had to go through all this crazy stuff. It was like 10 bucks a month or something, but someone found yeah, it. Like we three years. Found it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there were other things money. like we're paying for 78 <clears throat> users on this one software and we only have 35 employees because yeah. We'd add a user when someone got hired and not the lead user when they left. So it's like, you know, thousands of extra dollars a year we're paying on that. Like if you're a business and you're using like Google suite or something for your email, mm-hmm. when was the last time you actually went through and saw how many old users you're paying for every month, like 12 or bucks your a month phone or whatever service or some chat app yeah. or something like that. Yeah. There's a lot of things you can find. We found a lot. Your uh, insurance coverage. Or are you paying for more insurance than you need? It's there's, you know, you see the money go out and it's important to dig through Mm -hmm. and evaluate if you're getting return on that money and employees are great a great tool for helping find those things it's a great tip all right my tip for the week it's related to the branding stuff we talked about earlier i would say make a point of going back through your brand i'd say every two years maybe every three years Maybe more frequently, if you're a new business, maybe do it every year because things change so much. But while we were working through refreshing the website and talking with Eric and the other owners about like, well, what is Good Nature really about now? It really forced us to look at the company. What do we care about? What's important to us? How does this align with our values? And after you do that, Olivia, you work with a lot of your clients on doing this kind of thing. Um. Yeah. You come out of the other side more excited about the company because you're passionate Mm -hmm. about it. And it's like, this is great. This is my thing. You know, this brand aligns with my personal values. I think it's so important. And even if you do it and you come up with a great brand a few years later, it might be different than what your company has become. So I think it's important to go back and review that and sort of reset your mission statement. And um, I don't know, Olivia, maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, I feel like a lot of people, you know, they know they want a juice and then they come up with this great logo or something, but then they kind of just get lost in like, you know, who, what juice bar are they? Are they the neighborhood juice bar? Are they the family friendly that's, you know, pouring Nutella over things? Are they focused on the benefits of turmeric? Like those are all fine. You just have to figure out like, what are you there to do? And, and who do you want? What part of the community do you want to serve? And, and what is your point? Um, and then once you really figure that out, you know, um, then it's just like Charlie said, you're just like, God, that feels so much better than naming this juice, like kale. Yeah. You know, and like, it's just figuring out like, yeah, Olivia, I really do want to lean into like the benefits, the holistic benefits of these ingredients. All right, cool. Then, you know, we should probably shouldn't do an apple, lemon, ginger. We should probably go really deep in ingredients. Cause right now food cost is such that you're spending as much for an apple, lemon, ginger as you are for something that's 10 or 11 ingredients deep. So, you know, all of those again are fine, but it's just like figuring out what is that brand? Who do you want? What, what resonates with you and your community, right? Like, um, I just think that's so important. Then you can just go full force in that direction. And, and it's okay if, you know, four or five years down the road, you change a little, maybe you move from a glass bottle to a plastic bottle. Like you don't have to, you know, be so hard set on it, but But, um, really just knowing what you're, what you're there to do. And it's just, it helps so much. It helps you train your staff and know exactly what direction you're looking for as you start to look for menu expansion and that kind of thing. And if you're passionate about your brand and you feel like it sort of embodies your own personal spirit, it gives you more confidence to really push other people to make sure they're part of the brand. And if you see something that's not aligned with the brand, you bring it up and um, change things and everyone's aligned towards the same goal. I just think it's so important. Absolutely. All right. Good episode, guys. I'm going to Colorado tomorrow to do some snowboarding. Pretty excited about that. Ooh. I'm going to Florida right. on Saturday to not be in winter <laughs> <laughs> anymore. <coughs> I'm going to northern I'm Michigan. Wow. I'm Team Eric on yeah. that one. <laughs> I get enough snow. I get enough snow in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Buffalo has had enough snow lately. You know, I was really hoping Buffalo was going to win that last football game because Buffalo needed that win, but hopefully next year. 
Thanks for bringing it up, Charlie. <laughs> I was just going to say, God, Charlie. Well, Always I mean, sports. <laughs> Doom and gloom. I mean, on the last episode, we're like, yeah, you know what? Buffalo needs a Super Bowl win. And then it was um, a very fun, very fun year to watch the team. But we were there for the meeting. Yeah, I wouldn't even know known about the important game, but I was in Buffalo that week for the meeting. And then one of my friends was like, dude, you should stick around and watch the game, man. The Buff- this is Buffalo's year and all this stuff. I'm like, look, best of luck to you. But I'm traveling along with my two-year-old. I've got to go home. <laughs> and then, uh, so that's disappointing. But Okay, so everybody, thank you again for an awesome episode. Good to see everyone. Olivia, Wait, congrats on finally being in your home. Yep. Thank you. Uh, while Ari was talking about hazard plans the whole time today, I thought of a new tagline for him. <laughs> <laughs> you want to hear it, Ari? Yeah, of course. Cap it and ship it. Pass it. Don't skip it. That's uh-huh. what <laughs> You like it? I got <laughs> to find my pen. I got to find my pen. Give me my pen. <laughs> Work that into we'll the have... song, Charlie. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. We have to have him do a little like ad lib in the back. Like, yeah. Eric, what, what was it again? Pack it and Cap ship it. Cap it and ship it. Hassip, don't skip it. Like in the background, oh, it'll be like, pack it and ship it. Hassip, don't skip it. I like it. <laughs> These wet lawfer boys, I'll tell you what, boy band. That's awesome. Boy got bands so that didn't make un- it. So much untapped God. talent. You should see us dance. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not signing up for that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Thanks, everybody. Ciao. Bye, guys. Bye. I made lots of juice, and now I feel a boost. Baby, say, oh, it's the way I make my juice. Press in fruits and roots. This week I did it my way. Baby, say, oh, now let's have some fun. There is nothing greater than Friday's academia.